is that somebody that's based on someone that you know? What is your connection to the characters in this film? Yeah, so I mean, these were, you know, Kadir's an extension of me in a way of, like I said, I understand what it's like to um, feel lost, feel artistic, but maybe the environment around you doesn't necessarily nurture the artistry that is, is singing in your heart and in your soul. Um, yeah, my grandfather is named Luis Torres and was pretty much, you know, a lot of conversations we had with each other going to the same restaurant every day for lunch. Um, and like, I didn't have a seams, but I had a sleeves. But like when I ran away from home, he lived at home with his mother and at the time he was like the coolest dude ever, but now in retrospect, right. he was not the coolest <laughs> dude ever. Right, right. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, so this was all a really, this is my first feature script that I had ever written. Um, say success is preparation meeting luck. Because um, I made the short film version of this in 2017 with really no intention of wanting to make it a feature. I wanted to make it a play. Um, and then it, Sundance Institute reached out to me. Um, and if you guys don't know, Sundance Institute is like, they, Tarantino was their first fellow. <laughs> Ryan Coogler, Ava DuVernay, Paul Thomas Anderson, like, all the indie darlings that we know and love have gone through their, their program. Um, and they reached out to me and said, hey, you saw this short, you think it's really great. Our labs has closed, but if you could get us a script in two weeks, we'll, like, we'll consider you. <laughs> and it's crazy, because I remember I, 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 at the time, I was a commercial director, I was doing my biggest commercial ever. It was a $2 million Starbucks commercial. It was their first commercial. It was like a quarter million dollar paycheck. It was like the, the job that I had been working towards for 10 years. And I had to tell Sundance, like, I cannot write a script in two weeks. Like, I'm in the middle of this job, which was crazy because everyone who I respected who made films, they never made it past the first round of Sundance. So for them, and yeah, anyway, long story short, I told Sundance, there's no way I can write a script in two weeks, but like, I'll apply next year. And thankfully to them, they believed in me more than me. They were like, no, we'll fast track you to the final round, which will take five weeks, but your first draft will be up against everyone's fourth draft. So you probably won't get in, but if you want to take the challenge, here's the code. And I quit that Starbucks job, gave them back their $250,000, and I had already done like three months of work and started writing the script. So this was a very long-winded way of saying, I used my life more as a way to get this impossible task done in five weeks, more than me trying to write a story about my life. Right. So it was kind of like, opportunity to meet love. I was about to say it was impressive for two weeks because this story has a lot of layers. <laughs> and for them to uh, expect that in two weeks, I was just like, I was just like, not saying it can't be done, but that's a very difficult task for sure. Um, so I saw this film about two characters that were connected through grief, and I saw them as sort of like both filling a void for one another, and maybe to right wrongs in a way. And I thought it was brilliant how Luis disarmed him so quickly. And I don't, I don't know what it is that was what the short film is based on, but it did not really that scene right there did feel like a bit of a short film and how that could have been extended. And I honestly couldn't see anybody else play that role other than Louis school's mom who did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. so, and props to Louise because when COVID, we were supposed to start shooting this movie in 2020, in March of 2020, and we were two weeks out from filming and we got shut down because of COVID. We lost a million dollars in financing, mm. and Guzman, we had to pretty much start all over this movie, this movie was 1.5, and Guzman gave a half a million of his own money to keep us on schedule. Mm. So he's like, he's like the a literal angel. You know, for not only doing this movie for the SAG minimum, which is like 135 dollars a day, at the level, he's like just getting off Wednesday, he did this movie. 
And then when we lost this money, he gave his own money to keep us on schedule. So just a very magical person. Uh, that's amazing. So hearing that, please support it again. And please, you know, uh, especially in the independent crowd, you know, we need your support in every way. So tell a friend to tell a friend for sure. Um, and so with Luis's character, in that scene where uh, Kadir was trying to rob him. <laughs> in your opinion, what was it about Luis that Kadir saw in him that made him submit? Sure, I think that's a really great observation because a lot of my motivation was, you know, Luis is trying to pull him in at the beginning, but then when Kadir goes back, Kadir's got to pull him in. Um, but yeah, I think. I think Kadir at that point of the story is really looking for a father figure. Mm. You know, which I think that's why he is so enamored by schemes, is because from his perception, schemes is a leader. And and he's like the dominant male figure in his life. But you know, uh, he has Reggie at home. Reggie's not a bad guy, you know, so it's just it's funny that Kadir's searching for everything he already has at the beginning of the story. But at least from my perception, I think Kadir trusts Luis enough to go with him at the diner, which is a really tall ass, and you're committing your first tall robbery. <laughs> um, but I think it's because Kadir wants to feel safe, and he is looking for a father figure in some way. Right, right, right. As Kadir had to play a father figure uh, in his own life, so it was almost Absolutely. like the blind leading the blind. Uh, so, amazing. So, I have a two-part question. So, it is the 50th year of hip-hop. We just showed Juice yesterday by Ernest Dickerson, and that's always been sort of like the East Coast response to uh, Boys in the Hood for me. And um, mm. so, there are a lot of elements of hip-hop culture in New York all over this film. So, you have graffiti culture, the food, don't sweat the technique is in this film, and your opening scene, has the infamous Dolly shot, which Ernest also helped uh, pioneer. So to you, how important was it for you to bring authentic authenticity of the culture to the story, and what other New York films were influential to you? Great question. Um, I mean, I am, <laughs> uh, I'm hated by a lot of people because it had to be authentic, you know? Oh, I mean, that's a non-negotiable, though. You know, so I, <laughs> I mean, you know, people who are in control are always looking to hedge their bets. And without any white actors in my movie and in having slang for the first 15 minutes, um, this was not an easy movie to make. Uh, you know? Uh, but, uh, you know, that was really important to me. And, and I think when you make a film, especially your first film, it's so easy to lose yourself. You will lose yourself along the way. And Thelma Schumacher, who cuts all of Martin Scorsese's films, you know, she said your first movie should be something you know really well mm -hmm. because you are guaranteed to lose your way and you want to be able to lean on the things that are very instinctual for you. Right. So for me, the safety net of hip hop, the Bronx, Cuban sandwiches, like I know, I don't know a lot of things, but I know that. And those are just the things that I leaned on to keep to keep it real for me, but real for the people who I made it for, which is the people in this audience to understand what it's like to come from this world, more so than like pretentious film people. Um, so that was that. And then in terms of like New York influences, I mean, you know, Melvin and I studied a lot of Bishop. Um, for for our schemes as character, we studied a lot of Chris Brown. You know, people who um, who were once something and are now perceived that thing. And what does that do to your psyche as an artist? Um, uh, another big inspiration for mine was Fresh by Boaz Yakin. Was a massive inspiration in terms of buddy love dynamics. Um, and then I would say Finding Forrester, also shot in the Bronx um, by Gus Van Sant, was a huge inspiration in terms of tonality and the dynamic of 
an older antagonist and the younger protagonist and how their, their dynamic helps each other grow. Um, yeah, those are some of the main ones. Awesome, and thank you for standing your ground. Yeah, because uh, I mean, I know that once you start getting that funding and the things of that nature, it's almost like, you know, they hire you because they like you. <laughs> Until it's, well, time to make work. Until it's time to make the work, exactly. <laughs> um, so I want to open this up to the audience. Uh, if you have questions, we do have microphones. I don't know if anyone wants to pass them around or you want to come up, or you can just project your voice. We have good ears in here. after it's how you question yourself and the world around you so in anything I, I uh, experiment in but specifically visual storytelling um, I don't want to give I don't I want you to work I want to keep you engaged as a viewer um, Paul Thomas Anderson said if the audience is five minutes in front of you that's 30 minutes of work so I'm always trying to keep your imagination going because one, it keeps you engaged, but two, it gives you a unique experience even though we're all watching the same, the same event. Okay. Uh, great film. Bruh, great. You looking swaggy, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> hey, man. I respect it. Uh, my name is Tamar Davis. I am a publisher of a graffiti magazine. Oh, as well cool. as a librarian. Um, and one of the things I work with a lot of the noted historic um, graffiti artists, I've, I've seen in a film the name Scheme, but I have a great relationship with Scheme TNT, sure. Scheme NDS, Scheme that was actually under Phase 2. And Phase 2 was one of the leaders in terms of creating style, African American um, hip hop artists, I mean graffiti artists that actually passed away like a couple of years ago, he was in 67 uh, today. Um, <laughs> I love the film. I think it's great. One of the things that I like about the film is the way in which it depicts the impact of gang culture in, in graffiti, as well as, I mean, as well as being great artists, being hip hoppers, great dancers, and so on and so forth, but you were able to bring about the criminal element that's a very integral part of the hip hop, and a lot of people don't really understand that. Um, which is which is really really great. The other part that I was concerned with was because I'm a graduate of Pratt Institute. Yeah. I don't know whether or not the young man actually was was accepted into the school. Sure. I was like, did he get in or not? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Well, so you may have to make a second, a second, a second part. So the movie's in theaters October six. Okay. So the more people that go watch it, the more money they're going to offer me to make the sequel. <laughs> no, not a sequel, a series. I, the reason why I say that, right, is because when you're dealing with hip hop and hip hop culture, sure. it's a plethora of information told from different style, of different styles, different angles. It's like a enigma wrapped up in a, in, in, it's just a, a lot of information. And what I feel is that when you're dealing with graffiti, graffiti alone, there's, a, there's tons of crews, not just in the United States of America, because hip hop that actually, some argue it started in Philadelphia with mm -hmm. cornbread, some argue that 
cornbread. It's a Johnny come lately because there were graffiti artists that was tagging as far back as 1958. So, you know, the, the question is still out there. Where did it start from? Where did it begin? So on and so forth. But it's, and now, and now when you go into Germany, when you go into Canada, and you go all over the world, you see different styles. You see people doing like major skyscrapers in terms of artwork. And I, you know, I interview some of these people and I talk about that. But I think, in my opinion, maybe you may not want to do it, but if you're, if you're talking about a film in terms of graffiti, it's so broad of information in terms of gangs, in terms of this, in terms of that, in terms of hip hop, rap, that I feel that that really needs to be a series, an ongoing series, similar to the white. Sure. You know, sure. that's just my opinion. No, I, I, I feel, wow. my agent would love you. That's all they want me to do is make more versions of this. But, but, but you have to consider it because not just dealing with hip hop in America, if you look at Cummin, if you look at Pompeii, in every world in society, graffiti was an impeccable part of sharing information, sounding the alarm. Harriet Tubman, when she actually was moving, going up along, it was about symbols and tags and letting the other people that was moving along with her understand. So symbols and signs and stuff is a very important. So in my opinion, it's not enough just to have one movie. You need to have 50 movies about graffiti. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You, you, you. I know, I know that you would get along with all these guys. I know it's like being a hot train yard with the cans. It's and, real. Uh, it's real. Um, yeah, and in terms of him getting in a prat, you know, I think it's similar to the young lady's question prior of, you know, um, to me, my responsibility was for you to know that Kadir was going to be okay. In my opinion, I wrote the story myself, and at the end, he got you. He got you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Done. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, that's my favorite film that I've seen this entire festival. And I need to see it. Like, thank you so much, and I really appreciate you. For real. Thank, oh, you. thank you, man. For real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Eric Beal. I'm the graffiti guy. Um, yeah. And I've been writing and involved in the community for decades. I've been documenting it since the late 70s and most of an author, and I wanted to commend you on, on your attention to detail and uh, the authenticity across the board, and I think it was a really good choice in getting 2SA on there, yeah. because that really brought it to another level. Yeah, I mean, he's, so everyone, so you know, 2SA is the guy who did all of the artwork for Schemes, and he is an actual prophet in the graffiti world. He was homeless, selling art in Soho, and Pop Gallery, which is Andy Warhol's gallery, found him selling art on the street, and now his pieces go for like 50 grand. So, I mean, he is the epitome of the story. Yeah. So thank you for the knowledge of him. And beyond the, um, the graffiti itself, the, the, the attention on the sets and the, the apartments, really, really well done. Yeah, well, I appreciate you. I mean, that was another thing I had to really fight for, and I felt a certain responsibility. I mean, you know, this isn't the first movie where graffiti is the subject, per se, but at least in my experience, this was the first movie that was like graffiti, but emotional, and not graffiti 101, but you learn a little bit about it. So I felt a huge responsibility to this culture and this community, um, you know, because at least from the research I've done, graffiti is one of the last pure mediums in the world. Like, it's not run by some gallery committee, you know? Like, it's real street messaging. So, um, I really appreciate your acknowledgement of those details. Yeah, great job. Great Thank job. you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jasmine Way. Jasmine, yes, I know that's 
such amazing tension built throughout the entire film. All of the moments of transition from the beginning on, whether it was the drips of the tub that was the ominous looming over the deer throughout the entire movie, the, the feeling of the bathroom, whether it was the moment where he took the LSD and then ended up on the roof, we were all suspended in all of those moments, so it was really beautiful that you were able to capture those. And as an audience, we were fully there with you. And I feel what you're saying with keeping us engaged to the point where we're trying to use our imagination to break down what is happening behind closed doors. And that does keep us in the moment, so we're not trying to predict, who I know what's going to happen, blah, 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 blah. But um, one of the last things I wanted to say was, oh, and the moments with Louis. And when he's in the room and he's getting angry and we see Kadir start to notice those little hints. So all those little moments that weren't verbalized or trying to put it right on the screen for everybody to see it was really beautiful. And my question <laughs> was, what was it like in those five weeks developing the arc of Kadir with his highs and lows? Because there were so many moments and since it wasn't specifically a true story like by the book, what was it like to pick what moments were going to be his highs and lows? Yeah, great question. I mean, to be completely honest and fair to myself, that feels like 10 lives ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, because that was pre-pandemic, yeah. and so much has changed since. But, you know, I think um, I really just wanted to make an emotional film that was true to our audience. Mm -hmm. And we so rarely get the opportunity to make not poverty porn, yeah. you know? And, and that was just the thing that I kept challenging myself with every day. It was like, you know, Good Will Hunting was probably my number one, uh, I would watch it every day when I'd write this movie. And, you know, the movie had nothing to do with them being poor per se. It had nothing to do with, it just had to do with real characters being in real situations and you, you were just in the moment and it felt authentic and it felt emotional and that was just what I wanted. I wanted to make a movie that a thug could cry to. Okay, you know? I love that. And um, just because we don't get that. Tender, and even Kadir, like being the troubled young black kid in a society where it's not okay to show your emotions. We saw how he was really trying to fight and keep those things down. I'm so, so elated that, hey, if you got his breath, you know, hey, props to him, you know. Yeah, yeah. But thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Uh, first of all, I love this movie, and I love you. Don't, don't, <laughs> network on the movie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, this, this might be a, a little bit of a loaded question, but the thing with this movie is about real people making real art in real places. Yeah. And I think that uh, you being an artist turned filmmaker, right now, I feel like a lot of the artists in this world are putting in something really strange right now, especially with all our strikes, with AI art going around, and this creation yeah. of technology and what it's doing to our art. And so I just want to ask you, as an artist, as a filmmaker, where are you at with that? What do you think we can do to fight for our other artists? Yeah, beautiful question. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm in a weird place with AI. I have so many friends who are big Web3. They collected the NFTs and they did all that. And, you know, it's similar to the fine art world. I'm always going to question an industry where the sellers determine the demand. I just don't love that, you know? So I think about who benefits the most from this technology, and what I know is that the people who look like me don't benefit from this technology, at least the it is right now. So it's like, like I'm blind, I want LASIK, but it ain't been long enough. I wanna see what the long-term effects are before I get it, you know? I'm paranoid in that way. So it's a similar thing of AI, like, I don't wanna fully engage with it until I really understand who are the powers at that be, but, I think it's similar to like when DSLR came out. Everyone got a DSLR and everyone was a director and music video budgets literally overnight went from 100K to 5K because there's a kid with a 5D and a tripod who'll show up and he'll do it, right? So it's like, there's pros and cons. It's like, yeah, that hurts me because now the competitive pricing is so much cheaper because of DSLRs, but there's a kid who would never get the opportunity to make a music video, now he gets to make a music video. So I hope that 
somebody is utilizing the technology in order to get them in the door, but I just don't know yet. But great question. How you doing? My name is Angel. I'm in Shannon North Union. Great movie. Definitely great person that I can personally relate to in my life, especially when I was younger. I do have just two quick questions. My first question is, were there any scenes that were difficult, particularly difficult to shoot, and why? And then my second, um, my second question is also, you know, during the filming of the set, what was probably the most memorable moment? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, the hardest things to shoot was the diner because we did all of the diner scenes in one night. It was 13 pages. It was literally a 17 hour overnight. So that's, you know, 5, 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. And, you know, we were already in like week three. So I was just, that was a really tough night to just do all of that very deep expositional dialogue. Also shooting two people sitting at a table is some of the hardest directing you can do um, because you have to make that feel cinematic and because so many of the scenes are at the diner, there's only so many ways you can shoot it, but we're doing all the scenes in one night. So it was just a very difficult scenario and probably the most memorable um, was probably shooting the, the stuff at the school just because I went to that high school and that was my home room. And uh, that day Asante had on my tie that I would wear to school, you know? So <laughs> it was just very, um, you don't get a lot of moments to appreciate the hard work because you're so in it. You're just trying to go day to day to just like get through the workload. And that was a very unique and rare moment where I was forced to reflect on me going to the school and never fathoming that I would make a movie to then be directing a scene in that day. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, this was a short film, and you had different actors play these characters in the short film. Michael was Kadir in the short. Who's right there? Who's here? So, now you have this task of a feature, and you're the director, which means that you lead on the set. And then Luis Guzman walks in. Yeah. What's going through your mind? Is it like, I want you, let's try this, or is it like, it's Luis Guzman, he's fine, do your thing. What is it like being put in that position in your first feature film, working with someone who's been uh, basically iconic, <laughs> you know, uh, face and name on the scene? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, you know, that, um, moment of clarity happened with a lot of the actors, you know, because Asante it was the youngest Emmy nominee ever up until this year, and Melvin is like young black Hollywood star, you know, it was just a lot to take on for a first film, but I think coming from shooting music videos, rappers are crazy, and like, they, you know, this was easy in compared to that, you know what I mean? Uh, but you know, with Louis specifically, you know, um, he was a partner. He was beyond just, you know, one of the leads in my movie, you know, because we're both producers on it and he, he was a financier on it. You know, so I knew, you know, I would say like anyone who's going to make their first film, the, the, the most invaluable thing you can have is trust. Is having people around you who you can genuinely trust. Um, and he was just a blanket of comfort for me because whenever I felt overwhelmed or creatively depleted, he would instinctually feel that and help pull me back in. So, you know, I didn't really have to deal with, oh my God, this is Luis Guzman, how am I gonna direct him? We had such a shorthand by that point. And we, you know, we only shot this movie in 20 days, so, which is like normally movies get 40 days. This was like really, difficult shoot. Um, so I knew I knew going into prep that the majority of the work wasn't gonna be done on the day. 
the majority of the work we needed to be done in prep. Um, so we did a ton of rehearsals over Zoom, really understanding the scenes, really talking things out. So it's like by the time we're on the day doing principal photography, I'm only really nailing in like little fine tooth things and they bring so much to the table. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Dale? Uh, thank you, this is awesome. Thank uh, you. Did Luis choose his music or did you? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I think we chose it together. <laughs> we chose it together. I think I sent him like a folder and he picked like his favorite three, and then I picked my favorite three on whatever the overlap was. We, but you know, it was also the music we could afford. <laughs> very, very small movie. Awesome, so in closing, what would you like us to walk away with from seeing your film? Yes, beautiful question. Um, you know, like I was saying, anytime I make art, I always ask myself, you know, how is the audience gonna challenge themselves and the world around them? So I hope when you come out of this theater, maybe you don't look at graffiti as just vandalism anymore. There's, there's rules to this, and those three little letters in the bubble letters mean something that's representing something, and they had to work really hard in order to put those letters there. I hope that whenever you see someone sleeping on the train, your instinct isn't, this person is a burden, or they're in the way, maybe they, like, I always think about, imagine if you did everything right and you still ended up there. And, you know, I hope that, that, that this movie helps you at least think in that, in that way. Awesome, so in closing, uh, I want to thank you for being here. And I have a quick announcement is that I know when we end films, we like to do like those meet and greets. I just want for everyone in the theater to let's do our meet and greet upstairs. So we're just gonna like, Clear the theater, and we're just gonna go upstairs. We have some hors d'oeuvres and all that good stuff uh, for you. A little bit of an after party situation upstairs.